I've been looking forward to this day for several weeks, actually months, um, and al al although I have approached this day um, and, and the direction that we're moving in, in our ministry with a bit of anxiety, um, with extreme caution, because I have, whether you know it or not, what I have done is I have committed to teach expositional preaching, teaching, for the next 176 days. I, I've committed to do that. In other words, we're not going to have any topical preaching where I'm going to find a mess, uh, find a verse to fit what I want to say. Y'all understand what I mean, don't you? A lot of preachers do that, and I have done it, done it many times. But what we're doing is we're staying true to the Word of God in Psalm 119, and we're going to teach through it through the next several months. What we're attempting to do here is a concentrated look at God's Word, specifically Psalm 119. And I've titled the journey that we're taking, Pathways. Simply titled because we are all working down this pathway of our own life. Now, each of us has a pathway of our own. Now, if you're married, you have a pathway with your spouse that you walk together. If you have a family, you have a pathway that you want your family to move down. But I'm not talking about what we do corporately right now. We are studying corporately. We are reading corporately. I'm talking about our individual pathway. Each one of us finding out exactly what God wants to say to us individually. And as that happens, He, he will bring us together. So, I want you to do something. We're going to do something, start something new. I want you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 119. We're going to be reading the first eight verses. We have an official narrator. Brother Eric McWilliams has agreed to be every week our official narrator in the, in the passage that we're going to be reading. And I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Would you please stand? Brother Eric, whenever you're ready, kick us off. Psalm 119. Verses 1 through 8. Aleph. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy, pre thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with the uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake, not, oh, forsake me not utterly. Father, we ask you to bless the reading of your word. We stand in honor of the reading of your word. And we ask for your revelation to come through your word today to us. Amen. You may be seated. The title of today's message is, How Blessed is the One Who Obeys God's Word. It's as simple as that. Blessed is the one who obeys God's Word. I want to remind you that uh, God's Word reminds us that his word is here to actually reorder our lives. God's word is for us to be able to reorder or to reshape our lives. And he does that in terms of our salvation. We need, I, need, I want you to recognize that a lot of what we'll be talking about will be Old Testament things, but all of it is in relation to our salvation. Um, Psalm 119 is not intended 
to be a legislative law, but it is legislative law, okay? And we've heard a lot about legislative law lately, haven't we? And we don't want to hear any more of that politics stuff. I want to hear what the, the word of the law says, and I want to follow that law. Psalm 119 points us towards God's law, but it reminds us of his commands in God's law. But in all of that, we have to remember that all of God's word, now take note right now, all of God's word from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, all of God's word is written with a redemptive message in mind. A redemptive message in mind. So it's all written. God's word to us today comes to us in view of our salvation. Now the writer of Psalm 119, whether it was David or Ezra or Nehemiah, doesn't make any difference. The writer of Psalm 119 did not have what you and I have. We have, we're on this side of the cross. Okay, so he did not have that. Although, I believe he understood what it meant to be on this side of the cross. And why, how, do I, how do I know that? Because God's word is redemptive in its nature. Even though it's law, it's redemptive. Now Jesus came through the cross to what? Not abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So... That means God is not going to, said it last week, contradict himself about the word that he has given us. So he starts at the beginning redemptively. He starts at the beginning with a redemptive heart and understanding before the beginning of time. He starts with that redemptive nature. But then we get what we have and we read in the Old Testament being the law. The law was there for a purpose. The law was there to point people towards righteousness. The law was there to understand what it meant to worship and what it meant to sacrifice. There was, it was a reason for it. So God didn't think in midstream, you know what? You know, the law is a little heavy, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send Jesus on the cross, and we're going to make it a little bit easier with his grace. That is not the way God wrote it. God does not and will not and will never contradict himself in his word. It will not be. So we have to read his word. We have to listen to the revelation of his word in our life through a, re, a set of redemptive ears. Our ears have to realize and understand that everything God gave to us, he gave to us for the purpose of reordering or reshaping our lives. He meant for us to be reshaped, reordered. And so, <clears throat> when we look at uh, this, uh, this beginning in verse 1, when we start looking there, we, we look at the description of the blessed man. Blessed is the one who obeys God's word, it says. So let me, uh, I, I gave you a little simple outline in your uh, worship guide to fill in the blanks, but here it is. I'm going to give you all the blanks right now, and then we'll get past that, okay? And so... The progression of the writer's words to us in Psalm 119 in the first eight verses is, goes like this. The progression is simple. He says, I see, in, in verse 1, 2, 3, he says, I see what a man can be. I see what a man can be, okay? I see what a man can be. He recognizes it. And then in verse 4, he says, it is my duty to be this kind of a man. He recognizes what it is, and then he says, it's my duty to be that kind of a man. And then he says, oh, oh, I wish I was that man. Then he prays, and he says, I wish I was that man. So the, the opening verses are enorm give us enormous advantages of those who love and obey the Word of God. It says we're blessed. There's an enormous advantage to people of God when they recognize they're blessed. We have, we have great advantages when we recognize that and we see that. He also said that, uh, do not forsake me utterly in his prayer and God, and God would deal with me in grace or in mercy. Okay? So, 
when he said that, he, he realized that he had a duty. He realized what he was supposed to be. But then he said, Lord, deal with me in your mercy. So I got a feeling that David, the writer, knew what the mercy of God already was. Before, this is before the cross. This is before what we understand to be the cross of salvation. And so there's this enormous advantage that comes to people that love and obey the Word of God, and it's called blessing. So the psalm opens with a repetitive word, blessed, and a term uh, that occur, occur, occurs nowhere else in the psalm. This say, I'm talking about the Hebrew word now. The Hebrew word uh, occurs nowhere else. And so it's the repetition of this word blessed. And it basically means to go straight. That's what it means. And so it's when I, by the way, if I use the word happiness or I use the word joyful or if I use the word blessed, it's all synonymous, okay? It, it, you've heard me say, I'd rather be blessed than happy. You know, well, you know, there's happiness that comes by being blessed, okay? So it's all the same thing. So, so blessing finds its source in straight living, okay? And so adherence to the right path is to be done without deviation. See, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, sin is often viewed in terms of deviation from a path that has been laid out by God. So when the children of Israel said, this is where you're going to go, this is how you're going to go, and then they deviated from the path, what happened? They, you know, they took a few more laps around Sinai, and 40 more years they had to do something that they didn't have to do from the beginning had they followed God's plan. So in the Old Testament, sin or disobedience of God results in a deviation from the path that God originally gave you. And so there are two words that are translated blessed in the Old Testament. The distinctions between the two are very important. First of all, the first one refers to the condition that comes about by man doing something. You're blessed because you do something. This is a Hebrew word that teaches this. It's one of the Hebrew words translated blessed. The other describes the action of God initiated by God, which is irrespected of human merit or demerit. In other words, that would be you're blessed no matter who you are or what you do. Now, how many of you know because you know Jesus Christ, because you're walking in his ways, because you recognize the blessing that it, Jesus Christ is, how many of you know and can say, I'm a blessed individual? Of course you can. Of course you do. And so, do you believe and understand that you are blessed even if you don't obey? Of course you do, because we didn't obey before, but yet we asked Jesus to save us, and he saved us, and so now we are in obedience to our salvation, but yet you may still be a sinner. You may? Uh-uh. No, we are still sinners, right? Saved by his grace. Okay, so the, the two words that are used, one, the word's blessed, one is is that you're blessed because you do something. The other is you're blessed because you don't do a thing. Okay? Now, this word that is written here is blessed because you do something. Okay? Remember, we're Old Testament. We're in the legislative law. He said, you're blessed because you follow the duty that God has. Now, all of us know that we do not have to work for our salvation. There is a, there's not a duty that is set in motion for us to be saved. In other words, we don't have to go out here and work to get our salvation. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have to, and we should understand that we don't have to. So we don't have to work for our salvation. Scripture clearly says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says, confess uh, with your mouth and believe in your heart and thou shalt be saved. And so that is how you gain your salvation. So the context of all of this shows that the condition is that we are obedient to the Word of God and we are blessed. That's this definition, and this is the only place uh, that it is used in Psalm 119, this one word. He's talking about our duty. 
what we're supposed to do, okay? So the word blessed in verse 1 and 2 is plural. And we bring out this meaning by saying we are not just blessed, but we are fully blessed. We're completely blessed. We're, we're fully happy because we recognize that we are God's people, okay? And so we learn immediately where blessing is found. And here it is. It's, it is discovered in the last place that most men and women will look for it. Blessing is, comes to us because we obey the Word of God. I'm going to let it settle a minute. I'm going to let it settle a minute. This is what this writer is saying. Blessing comes when we obey the Word of God. That's exactly where blessing comes from. Why? Because it is a duty of ours to obey the Word of God. And so that's where our blessing comes from. Now, the fully blessed person is described as one whose way is blameless. Now, the word way here is translated, found 12 times in this psalm. And I'm just going to list them out for you real quickly. Uh, uh, it, one, one way that it is uh, translated way is it means to be the revealed will of God. So the way is the revealed will of God. Each one of us has a revealed will of God that we have a responsibility to follow in our life. I have one. You have one. This is the charted course talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. That, that we have a charted course before us that's already been laid out by God. Do y'all know that? Do y'all understand that? You need to understand this because God has already charted a course for you. He, he's already got a plan for your life. Everybody says, well, I wish I knew what I'm supposed to do. Well, you, he's already got that plan. If you will read his word and obey his word, he will show you how and order your steps within his word to do exactly what he charted out for you to do. That is exactly the way it works. This writer knew that. The writer of this psalm knew that. Blessed is the, is the one whose way is blameless who follows the revealed will of God. And it's in verse 14, verse 27, verse 32, verse 33, verse 37. I told you, you're going to read the repetitive word over and over again. Why? Because he, we don't get it the first time. We just don't get it the first time. Oh, y'all are just too arrogant to believe that you can say amen to that. We don't get it the first time. We just don't. I don't care how many times I get browbeat with this stuff. The Lord still teaches me something way on down the line when I thought he taught it to me to begin with and I tried to do it that way and, act, and then, I, then I stepped out of his will and I tried to do it my way and realized I was going down the wrong path. And all of a sudden I realized how disobedient I had been to God's word. Maybe I need to say this a different way. You know, none of us disrespect God's Word, I don't think. We believe in it. We know what it is. But when God's Word is supposed to teach you and guide you in the will that He has for your life, and you don't do it, guess what you're doing? You're disrespecting God's Word. When we go down a pathway that is not charted for us and we try to make that happen, we're disobedient to what God wants to do. And if we're disobedient to God, we're disobedient to His Word. Nobody likes to hear that. But it's the truth. It's the absolute truth. Now we're blessed if we follow His Word. We're blessed if we're guided by His Word. So let's look at the word blameless also. It means to be complete. It means to be sound. It means to be unimpaired. It needs to be whole. It means to be healthful. It is described of the animals that were without blemish and therefore accepted for sacrifice. That's what blameless means. Okay? And so it follows that the word it does not denote moral perfection. It denotes that God's standard 
is higher than man's attainment. In other words, we cannot attain God's standard. We're constantly having to work at it. And how do we do that? We have to obey His Word. Not just one time, but every day I wake up and read His Word. I've got to obey His Word that day. And that puts me in a way that is blameless. Now, let me see if I can explain. Uh, quickly, Ephesians chapter 1. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 1. You've got to bring your Bible or bring your device and go fast with it. Ephesians chapter 1. Where, where, where does it say this? Well, what, uh, another one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible is Ephesians chapter 1. But look at verse, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be... Holy and what? Blameless. Blameless. In His sight, in love, He predestined us to be adopted according to the sons through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about predestination here. I'm talking about a God that had from the beginning of time a redemptive nature. His nature from the beginning, from the get-go, was redemptive. And because God knows everything there is to be known, He knew that He we made His creation of His people, His human beings, and He didn't make them puppets. We are not puppets, folks. He gave us the free will to make choice of our own. And in that, in His sovereignty, in His omnipotence, in the fact that He knows everything, He knew we couldn't do it. Before the beginning of time, he knew that. But he chose us. Come on, y'all. He chose us in him to be holy and blameless. It's his desire for us to be holy and blameless. And there's only one way that can happen. When you give Jesus Christ your life, and Jesus Christ becomes holy in you, and he provides the righteousness in your life, in your life that only God can see you, as complete and righteous that's the only way it happens so not only did he know that it was going to happen but he says okay who's going to step up to the plate and die for these people and be the unblemished sacrifice come on y'all that will be blameless before man and before God and 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 die for the sins of the world Jesus said I will oh my goodness don't tell me it's an Old Testament teaching. This is Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament, folks. If you'll just look at it, if you'll just understand it. And so, the fully blessed man is the one who walks in the way of the Lord, whose way is blameless, who walks in the law of the Lord. And the word walk here is an active participle in the Hebrew. And so, it, 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 it means continuing, continuous action. It means that it's not just our walk today but it's a continuing walk see the word walk is a metaphor walking is a metaphor for our conduct this is how we act the word run in the Bible is used as a metaphor for service so we so we walk in perfect conduct with the Lord by obeying his word and then we run toward the service or the duty that he has for us to do now, verse 2. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we'll get along. We'll get there. Don't worry. Verse 2 repeats the reference to the fully happy man. The verb translated is keep. It says keep. It has a broader meaning than the English translation can convey. Sometimes some of the Hebrew words don't translate exactly to what English can mean, uh, mean in, uh, create the meaning of what the, the word is. And so keep is one of them. And so it really means for us to be guarding. It's used as a watchman of a city. He's a guard. And what are you supposed to guard? The word testimonies is a synonym for scripture. Remember, we talked about that last week. And so the words observe his testimonies are in construct to a relationship. In other words, you cannot observe the testimonies of God unless you have a relationship with Him. There has to be a relationship. Otherwise, you're a slave. 
If you're just doing what somebody said and you don't have a relationship with somebody, what is that? You're a slave. But if you are in relationship with God and you hear His Word and He speaks to you through His Word and you obey His Word, now that relationship becomes a blessed relationship. And so now you walk in His ways and you walk according to His ways and you walk according to the law of the land, which is the Torah, which, is, which means instruction. Now, this was speaking specifically of the Torah, which would be the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, okay? So that's what the law of Moses. This is what the writer was writing to. You, re, you realize that David didn't have the New Testament. He only had the law. So he's referring to this. Remember what I said? It's a legislative law that is not legislative. Let me see if I can explain this again. I was afraid this was going to happen. There is the law of God, and for every law of God, God gave a way for that law to be obeyed. He gave a specific way for that to be obeyed. Now, he also gave a way for that to be done again and be accepted. So God gave grace in the Old Testament even though we didn't recognize it as grace because Jesus hadn't come yet. David understood this. He understood this. He's the one that wrote, cleanse my heart. Cleanse me with hyssop. Renew my heart. Renew, my, renew a steadfast spirit in me, he said. See, David already knew this. He knew that the relationship with God would, goes beyond the legislative law of Moses. He knew it. He couldn't write what he wrote about it. As the deer panteth after the water, so my soul longeth after you, O Lord. Do you get it? Are you understanding how powerful this Word of God really is? And so, verse 3 is the capstone of this. We're known as truth protectors. We're known as watchmen of the Word. How are you a watchman of the Word? Well, it's when you know, when you have the Word so deep ingrained in your heart that when somebody says something that you know is not the Word, you cannot argue with them, but you can set them straight. You can be a protector of God's Word. By the way, don't listen to what you're, don't listen to everything that you are hearing coming over the airways right now about the political thing because people are using God's Word wrongly to make their point. It is absolute not true what they're saying. You've got to be careful. Who is to be a protector of God's law? It is the people of God are to be a protector of God's law. And so that's what it means to walk in the way of the Lord, the law of the Lord. Verse 3 is a capstone. You know what a capstone is. I taught you about this before. A capstone is the thing that holds it all together. You know, the, the, there's the cornerstone, there's the keystone that holds the arch together, and the capstone goes on top, and it holds the whole wall together. That's what this is all about. Verse 3 is the capstone. So, I'm going to go on to verse 4. I'm going to talk about verse 4, 5, 6, and eight, six through 8. First of all, in verse 4, we have the duty of the blessed man. You, you, we, you, before, we said, what is the... What is the duty of, uh, uh, that we're supposed to do? Well, here it is. Thou hast ordained thy precepts that we should keep them diligently. All right. We've already talked about precepts. The word precepts means the charge of the duty. In other words, the, the charge has been given. The duty has been given to you. So it says the word precept means to, to charge with duty, and it means to also to be ordained. He says thou hast ordained the charge of the duty. That's what it says. That's how it translates. And so the verb ordain means to lay down, to establish. Now the second half of the verse reveals the imperative of man. It means to keep diligently or to literally keep very much 
are to be in full obedience to the precepts that thou hast ordained. So he has ordained, he's chosen a pathway for us to walk in. God has set forth that precept. He's given us inside that pathway, he's given us a charge to fully obey. And the only way that we get off of the path is we don't follow what God has ordered us to do. Now, I, I, I know what you may be thinking. You said, well, you know, I know I want to do this. Everybody wants to do this, folks. Nobody wants to disobey God. I really don't think you do. If you have anything in your heart about who Jesus really is, I don't think anybody just, de just desires to disobey God. The problem is the devil will lie to us in certain ways, and we will think we're doing God's will, and we're not even close. And then... If by chance we do something that is not godly and we see some benefit of that, then all of a sudden we keep walking down the wrong path. We're not on the ordained path that he has given us. So the only way to do that is to diligently go back and read his precepts and follow his precepts. So he desires to be this man. He, it verse forth uh, in verse 5, it says, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep thy statutes. He says, this is actually an exclamation point word here. It, it, it actually means it's an intense emotion. Oh, I want to follow you, God, is what he's saying. He says, I want to. I desire to do that. I desire for you to have it established in me. He desires to be this kind of a man. But something stands in his way. See, all of us desire to be this person that is being described here. But, but there's always something that can stand in our way. Something stands in our way. What is the roadblock? Road well, let me tell you what the main roadblock is. The main roadblock is this. This is the lack of resolution in your own heart that you will, no matter what, obey the, Lord, the word of the Lord. Let me say it again. The major roadblock for any one of us getting off the path is, a resolution, is the lack of resolution in our heart that we will, no matter what, obey God's word. You have to resolve this ahead of time. You don't resolve this after the fact, folks. Listen to me carefully. This is very important. You don't resolve that you're going to try to follow after the fact. Now, you get forgiven for what you've done. Now, this is, this is very important because, you know, there's sometimes we, 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 we start... We start having instability in our life or doubt or anxiety or depression or things happen in our life and we don't understand why those things are happening. Well, I don't think God orchestrates those things, but I think what we get in is we get into a confusing state because we don't know what God is really saying to us. And because we don't know, we're out here in some kind of a position to where we're in depression or we're unstable or we have anxiety because we just don't know what to do next. God, I want to be that man. He said, I want to be the one that follows you. But something is standing in the way. It is because we have not resolved that we're going to obey God and obey his word. Now, I know that's a hard word right now, but this is the whole thing. Be ready for this because this is going to hit us all through this thing. I've already had a few. Look, I can't point one without pointing three back at me. I've already had had to deal with this myself there can easily be something in the way of what God really wants you to be and who he wants you to be and it, we have to resolve ahead of time we have to resolve ahead of time I'm going to obey your word God even if it hurts even if it's difficult even if it's hard to do. He said the desire to be the blessed man in, in, in David's life was this. Oh, that I could be that way. That means sometimes, listen, listen, folks. That means sometimes you've got to step out of the past and move into the future. 
And you've got to resolve that God's Word is bigger than whatever happened to you before. You've got to resolve that God is bigger than anything that has ever happened to you that has not been right in your life and you, you have instability, you have depression about that. You've got to walk out of the past and into the future that is God's words and His pathway for you to walk down. You've got to be able to resolve that God's word can do that. You see, because I know God's word can do that. Anybody else? We got, come on y'all. God's Word can do that. God's Word can take you out of wherever you've been and take you to wherever He wants you to go. As long as you resolve that you're going to obey that Word. Very important teaching. Then it says, I shall not be afraid when I look upon thy commandments. So, so he anticipated looking upon this commandments. Now let me get to this part and then we'll finish, okay? There's a, I've learned a lot about the Hebrew that I didn't want to learn, okay? I did not desire to do a Hebrew study when I did this, but I had to do a Hebrew study because some of the words that I were reading and some of the things I was studying and looking at the commentaries, I didn't get it. So hopefully I can help you get it. So the word then in this next, uh, in verse 6, the word then, I shall not be ashamed when I look upon thy commandments. The word translated look upon is a hiphil. It's called a hiphil. H-I-P-H-I-L. A hiphil. Everybody know what a hiphil is? Okay, neither did I. We're going to learn something. In the Hebrew language, there are words. and it's, By the way, did you know Hebrews is backwards? You read it from right to left. Okay. So when you're, by the, so, so if you're in the, in the computer and you're ta- typing out a word that you want to be translated to Hebrew, it's really funny because you're typing out precept and it goes P-R-E-C. <laughs> it goes backwards when it, and I'm saying, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing backwards? You know, it, it even types it backwards, okay, because it's written backwards. But a hiphil, a hiphil, this is very important. A hill is just one little eek. That's all it is. That's all. It's, it's a word, and in the word, there's nouns. Uh, you, you know, there, there's vowels in that in, the, in there and consonants. Not very many vowels, by the way. And 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 so one word will be translated, and it'll look just like this. And the next word will look exactly like like it, except it has a. Eek. It's got a hill. That's called a hill. Now, the best way I know how to explain this is this. A hiphil means that a verb becomes causative. It's not just a verb. It means also, the verb means to cause it. That's the difference. The hiphil, so if, if you've got a verb in Hebrew and then you get the hiphil, it means it's causative. It's a causative language. It's, a, it's called a causative stem. So he's, so what, what is he saying here? I look upon the, thy commandments, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn thy righteous judgments. He says, I look upon. So the best way, best way to explain this for me is I had to go to Psalm 23. Now everybody knows Psalm 23, I hope. You don't have to turn there. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I shall not want, right? So... He makes me, causative verb, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me, causative verse. Does this, does this say anything to you? Come on, come on. You, you, you can't listen to the shepherd and do what the shepherd says if you're constantly out here disobeying what the shepherd says. So the shepherd says, okay, sheep, Dumb sheep, it's time for you to lay down. Come on, y'all. He causes it to happen. He causes, 
I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I've been so tired, so overwhelmed, so, so out of sorts with everything that God makes me sick. Y'all, y'all, don't, y'all don't get that. I, I'll be, I, let, 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 let me rephrase this. I get sick and God lets it happen. No, I, you know, I had to get y'all's attention. Y'all are halfway asleep and ready to go eat already. Listen, there's times when that has happened. He's made me lie down. It's a causative verb. David is saying, cause me. Listen, he's saying, cause me to obey your commands. Oh my gosh. Listen to what he's saying, folks. He's saying, I can't, I can't follow your precepts on my own. He's saying, God, cause me to look upon your word. Fall in love with it and obey it. Would you bow your heads? Father, we pray, cause us today to fall in love with your word. Cause us, Lord, to understand what it means to follow your precepts, to follow your your statutes, to follow your commandments. Lord, even when it hurts us, even when we don't understand how to, even when, Lord, it's going to be difficult to, cause us, Lord, to rest in you, believe in you, and trust and obey you.